Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain fairy tales and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original literature instead of just reading the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily for people who just want a story to follow along with and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Any support you can offer helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks and enjoy the show. everyone. I'm Natalie, and I'm here with two of my favorite humans, Angel and Polly. Today we are discussing the 12 dancing princesses. Are y'all ready to get started? Yeah, sounds like fun. Polly, why don't you get us started with the cultures that this story developed in? Well, the earliest that it was put down in fixed form was when it was written down by the Grimm's brothers in the mid-1800s. It was a folk tale before then, shared by oral tradition. 12 dancing princesses, or Desertanstan Shue, the torn or ruined shoes is one of the tales they wrote down when you have a tale that only exists in oral tradition it's going to change depending on who is telling the story yeah like the number of princesses the guy that they collected this from was their friend who had a whole lot of brothers and sisters so 12 probably wasn't a huge number to him i guess it's all a matter of perspective <laughs> The Grimms went throughout Germany getting people to tell them all their folk tales and writing them down so that they could be shared in book form. Folk tales are very much a product of the people telling the story. Parents tell their children the tales they want to hear themselves or tales that teach their children the lessons they want them to learn. You're not going to find tales telling the dangers of desert gin being invented by people who live in the Black Forest. Folk tales in the East are also less about marriage and more about adventure. They have friendly animals or wise humans to help them, a clever monkey or a wise snake. Norwegian women were off hitching rides with the North Wind to the land of the giants. Sounds more fun than just dancing to me. <laughs> me too. I want to go meet a giant. <laughs> right? <laughs> European tales outline heavily how little control women had over their lives. Because here you have this king who's got 12 beautiful daughters locked in their bedroom at night, you know? And they're sneaking out to go dancing. And he wants to know where they're going because, you know, how dare they sneak out to go dancing? <laughs> you know, that kind of reminds me of my dad. When he built the house I grew up in, he had all daughters and he designed the bedrooms so that all the windows were really thin and way up against the roof line with none of the windows down low. It seemed like it would make it impossible for his girls to sneak out. Yeah, nah. <laughs> they just devised these ingenious ways of climbing through tiny high up windows and they would go <laughs> dancing and then they would sneak back in <laughs> through through these like the roof high windows their friends would like boost them up so they could reach them <laughs> from outside because you know the yard was distinctly lacking in furniture that they could have used to help them reach the, the window <laughs> that's okay friends are good for that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the king's actions uh, to me are not quite so distant past of fatherly behavior well, the kingdom these princesses sneak out to is under their bed, so they kick the bedstead and it opens. <laughs> a little easier than climbing out a high window. <laughs> <laughs> That's where all the magic is, hidden beneath the bed. So, just out of curiosity, why do you think they use 12 instead of, like, 6 or 3? Well, numbers are significant in folk tales. 3 and 7 are often sacred or magical, while 12 is used to signify a, an exaggerated amount of something. So this king had a lot of daughters. You know, that, that, that's true. I have a feeling <laughs> we will end up talking a lot about the meaning behind numbers. Because not only is 12 often used to show an overabundance of something or the passage of time, but threes are used for mystical purposes. You know, you have the Christian Trinity, the Chinese Great Triad, you know, man, heaven, earth, or the Buddhist triple jewel, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. But as a literary device, it also adds suspense to the narrative while proving that nothing that is seen is coincidence. With the hero following them on three different nights, it establishes a provable pattern. So it isn't like, oh, I saw them this one time. Instead, it's like, no. They do this every night, and he has proof, <laughs> you know? Yep. So 
We're going to move on to how the story changed over time, because in some of the other versions, there were less princesses. I know one of them has a single princess who has a name. Oh my goodness, they gave her a name? Oh yeah, scandalous, giving females names. We have to read the Scottish one at some point, just because she's named Kate Crackernuts. I told you about that one before. Oh my god, that one's awesome. Isn't Kate the hero in that version? Kate is her own hero in any version. It's just so very Scottish. I went and read that one after Polly mentioned it. and It is my favorite. It was like a gender swap version. Two stepsisters and the stepmom cursed her stepdaughter with a sheep's head because she was prettier than her daughter Kate. And then the two sisters just up and left. Road trip, destination anywhere but here. So then she <laughs> saved her sister and a sick prince by stealing from a fairy baby. <laughs> Cue a thousand stealing from a baby jokes. <laughs> yeah. Like candy. <laughs> <laughs> she she needs her own episode for sure. <laughs> so, Polly, why don't you get us started on how it has changed in some of the other versions? So, like many folk tales, it also exists in some form in other countries. France has a version called Les Deux Princesses Dansantes. And there's a tale in Scotland that is very similar, which I just mentioned, which was recorded by Andrew Lang and Joseph Jacobs in the late 1800s. In Russia, Alexander Afanasyev recorded a version called Nachni Tansi, or The Night Dances. The early versions have any unsuccessful suitors being executed or poisoned, while in later versions they just go on about their business or marry the extra princesses. It changes the same way that most stories changed. By the time it got to the Barbie version, the old man had become a young shoemaker, and the girls had more personality. Their father loved them, and he just wanted what was best for them, because every girl wants a loving father. You know, actually, in some of the other versions of the story, it isn't a soldier who is the hero, but a cobbler who was having to repair all the shoes. So it's interesting that in the Barbie version, they made the old man into a shoemaker. In the Barbie version, the hero marries the middle child, but it's because they're in love, not because, you know, he had his pick of the litter. They gave the princesses more free will as society progressed past the strict patriarchal traditions of the 19th century. So that's the main thing that changes between the original versions and the newer versions. The princesses have more autonomy. They also have names, which is new. The heroine, played by Barbie, is named Genevieve. Her sisters, all named alphabetically, are Ashlyn, Blair, Courtney, Delilah, Edlin, Fallon, Hadley, Isla, Janessa, Kathleen, and the youngest, Lacey. <laughs> Those are some super 90s names. <laughs> totally. <laughs> That's almost horrifying. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> running those names through my head and I'm just like, that's, that's painful. Okay. So the princesses actually get to decide which one of them marries the guy in the Barbie version. Well, yeah, that they're all very excited about it because they can see that Genevieve is building this relationship with this handsome shoemaker and, and they all, they all support her. It's not like they're being jealous, you know, I want, I want him, you can't have him. Oh, that's just not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> not with 12 sisters, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no. There was another one that I read that had each suitor eventually getting to marry one of the princesses. So they all got married, which is the goal for any woman in these stories is just to be married. But even when the lead character of the tale is a male... His end goal is to rescue and ultimately wed a beautiful, but usually otherwise useless princess or damsel in distress. Oh, of course, because, you know, <laughs> marriage is so much better than being beheaded. Though technically beheading in a story is also a way of showing that the suitors were of noble blood, since beheading tended to be limited to those of noble birth who were convicted of treason. So you're saying that not figuring out where the princesses were sneaking out to go dancing was treasonous? That's presumptuous. <laughs> well, <laughs> they weren't giving the king what the king wanted. And of course, <laughs> not giving the king what the king wants is certainly treason. That's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> and it may sound gory to us, but if done correctly, it was actually a more humane form of execution than other forms they had at the time. But the key to that is done correctly. A good executioner with a sharp axe. 
meant the victim lost consciousness within like two to three seconds. <laughs> the problem was finding a good executioner. Well, it takes skill. <laughs> it's hard to find good help these days. Oh, <laughs> It's probably my modern sensibilities, but I just find it less appealing with the beheading from the original. They're just throwing away princes. <laughs> well, since they had so many kids, all the extra princes could be problematic, politically speaking. Yeah, it seems like a lot of these fairy tales begin with killing all the extras in the older versions and then finding a more genteel <laughs> way to deal with them once they got revised. Probably during like Victorian times, like when this one was revised. So the one I mentioned earlier must have been in the Victorian time when they stopped with the beheading. Because if I remember correctly, they didn't get to marry just because they were there. It was after one person figured it out and picked a princess. Then they all just got married because I guess they had all these extra princes laying around. So why not? I mean, waste not, want not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so Victorian, too. The prince who figures out the puzzle cries winner and gets to pick first from the prize table you know the princesses and then all the runners up get to pick prizes other princesses <laughs> i wonder if they had to go in order <laughs> sorry it just, you just made me think of my classroom whenever whenever i have prizes when i'm making it to the top of the leaderboard when we do like cahoots and stuff and they're all like how come they get to go first how come only the top three get a prize <laughs> well because they figured out where the princesses were going. Because <laughs> they actually studied. They made it to the top of the leaderboard. You didn't tell me there was a test. <laughs> There's always a test. I just find it interesting. How many of these stories have this attitude of the women just being possessions that are offered up as prizes or, you know, as bribes? As you mentioned, not even given a name. The princesses in the original stories just don't have enough importance to even be named. That's just crazy to me. Not even 90s names. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, you have a point. Maybe not having a name was a blessing. <laughs> well, not giving them names is kind of a way of making the characters an everyman character. Like, Every girl listening could imagine, oh, I'm the princess. Mm. Nice point. But on the other side, women being possessions, that's the Christian influence. You could tell when countries were influenced by Christianity by the flavor of their folk tales. In Britain and France, you see it much earlier, certainly just as soon as the tales are being recorded, while Norwegian tales stayed wild and pagan a little longer. There, the lead in the story, often female, goes off and has wild adventures all on her own and solves all her own problems. But you never see that in the more Southern European tales, English tales and German tales and French tales. The girls always need help. You know, somebody has put them in this situation and that's up to them to fix it. Yes, they may be clever or beautiful, but the end goal is a handsome husband. In the stories, they're just eldest and youngest. And then just, you know, middle kids are the background. They don't talk about the others except in the Barbie version. <laughs> Those middle kids. Yeah, nobody cares about the middle kids. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I'm in a two kid family. So, you know, we didn't do middle. We just skipped that. <laughs> so, Polly, do you have a favorite version that you were wanting to read today? Yeah, let's let's move on to the reading of the story and then we can discuss some of the details of it and our thoughts. <laughs> The Twelve Dancing Princesses, recorded by the Brothers Grimm. Once upon a time, there was a king who had twelve daughters, each more beautiful than the other. They slept together in a hall, where their beds stood close to one another. At night, when they had gone to bed, the king locked the door and bolted it. But when he had unlocked it in the morning, he noticed that their shoes had been danced to pieces, and nobody could explain how it happened. So the king sent out a proclamation saying that anyone who could discover where the princesses did their night's dancing might choose one of them to be his wife, and should reign after his death. But whoever presented himself and failed to make the discovery after three days and three nights was to forfeit his life. A prince soon appeared and offered to take the risk. He was well received, and at night was taken into a room adjoining the hall where the princesses slept. His bed was made up there, and he was to watch and see where they went to dance. 
and so that they could not do anything or leave without being seen, the door of the room was left open. But the eyes of the prince grew heavy, and he fell asleep. When he woke up in the morning, all twelve princesses had been dancing, for the soles of their shoes were full of holes. The second and third evenings passed, with the same results. The prince was then granted no mercy, and his head was cut off. Many others came after him and offered to take the risk, but they all forfeited their lives. Now it happened that a poor soldier who had been wounded and could no longer serve found himself on the road to the town where the king lived. There he fell in with an old woman who asked him where he intended to go. I really don't know, he said, and he added in fun. I should like to discover where the king's daughters danced their shoes into holes, and after that I should like to become king. That is not so difficult, said the old woman. You must not drink the wine which will be brought to you in the evening, but must pretend to be fast asleep. Whereupon she gave him a short cloak, saying, When you wear this, you will be invisible, and then you could slip out after the twelve princesses. When the soldier heard this good advice, he considered it seriously, plucked up the courage to appear before the king, and offered himself as suitor. He was as well received as the others and was dressed in royal garments. In the evening, when bedtime came, he was conducted to the anteroom. As he was about to go to bed, the eldest princess appeared, bringing him a cup of wine. But he had fastened a sponge under his chin and let the wine run down into it, so that he did not drink one drop. Then he lay down, and when he had been quiet a little while, he began to snore as though in the deepest sleep. The twelve princesses heard him and laughed. The eldest said, He too must forfeit his life. Then they got up, opened cupboards, chests, and cases, and brought out their beautiful dresses. They decked themselves before the glass, skipping about and reveling in the prospect of the dance. Only the youngest sister said, I don't know what it is. You may rejoice, but I feel so strange. A misfortune is certainly hanging over us. You are a little goose, answered the eldest. You are always frightened. Have you forgotten how many princes have come here in vain? Why, I need not have given the soldier a sleeping draft at all. The blockhead would never have awakened. When they were all ready, they looked at the soldier, but his eyes were shut and he did not stir. So they thought they would soon be quite safe. Then the eldest went up to one of the beds, knocked on it, and it sank into the earth, and they descended through the opening one after another, the eldest first. The soldier, who had noticed everything, did not hesitate long but threw on his cloak and went down behind the youngest. Halfway down he trod on her dress. She was frightened and said, What was that? Who's holding on to my dress? Don't be so foolish. You must have caught it on a nail, said the eldest. Then they went right down, and when they got quite underground, they stood in a marvelously beautiful avenue of trees. All the trees were silver and glittered and shone. The so soldier thought, I must take some token with me. And as he broke off a twig, a sharp crack came from the tree. The youngest cried out, All is not well. Did you hear that sound? Those are the triumphal salutes because we have eluded our prince, said the eldest. Next they came to an avenue, where all the leaves were of gold, and at last into a third, where they were of shining diamonds. From both these the soldier broke off a twig, and there was a crack each time which made the youngest princess start with terror. But the eldest maintained that the sounds were only triumphal salutes. They went on faster and came to a great lake. Close to the bank lay twelve little boats, and in every boat sat a handsome prince. They had expected the twelve princesses, and each took one with him. But the soldier seated himself by the youngest. Then said her prince, I don't know why, but the boat is much heavier today. I am obliged to row with all my strength to get it along. I wonder why it is, said the youngest, unless perhaps it is the hot weather. It is strangely hot. On the opposite side of the lake stood a splendidly bright lighted castle from which came the sound of the joyous music of trumpets and drums. They rode across, and every prince danced with his love, and the soldier danced too, unseen. If one of the princesses held a cup of wine, he drank out of it, so that it was empty when she lifted it to her lips. This frightened the youngest one, but the eldest always silenced her. They danced till three the next morning, when their shoes were danced into holes and they were obliged to stop. The princes took them back across the lake, and this time the soldier took his seat beside the eldest. On the bank they said farewell to their princes, and promised to come again the next night. When they got to the steps the soldier ran on ahead, lay down in bed, and when the twelve came lagging by, slowly and wearily, he began to snore again very loud. So that they said, 
We are quite safe so far as he is concerned. Then they took off their beautiful dresses, put them away, placed the worn-out shoes under their beds, and lay down. The next morning the soldier determined to say nothing, but to see the wonderful doings again. So he went with them the second and third nights. Everything was just the same as the first time, and they danced each time till their shoes were in holes. The third time the soldier took away a wine cup as a token. When the appointed hour came for his answer, he took the three twigs and the cup with him and went before the king. The twelve princesses stood behind the door listening to hear what he would say. When the king put the question, Where did my daughters dance their shoes to pieces in the night? He answered, With twelve princes in an underground castle. Then he produced the tokens. The king sent for his daughters and asked them whether the soldier had spoken the truth. As they saw that they were betrayed and would gain nothing by lies, they were obliged to admit it. Thereupon the king asked the soldier which one he would choose as his wife. He answered, I am no longer young. Give me the eldest. So the wedding was celebrated that very day, and the kingdom was promised to him on the king's death. But for every night which the princes had spent in dancing with their princesses, a day was added to their time of enchantment. Thank you, Polly. So what do you think the original lessons of the story were for the people who were telling the story? In the original story, the princes that the princesses went to dance with in fairyland were punished in some way. It's implied that the princes are somehow trapped in the fairy kingdom, so maybe they were trying to seduce the princesses to join them, and they failed and were punished. Okay, so that's what it meant at the ending there, about each day they danced, they were enchanted? Well, everyone knows you're not supposed to eat or drink in fairy because then you're obligated to pay the fairies back for the food and drink. So the princes are trapped there somehow, and they're giving the princesses food and drink to get them trapped as well. The soldier takes food and drink, but he steals it from the princesses, so it's on them instead of him. He's free to go. <laughs> Rude. Huh. Interesting. And so also the fact that they were going down when they went through this secret door is a symbol that aligns with going into the underworld, especially with them being ferried across the river, like going across the river Styx. The entire setting in fairyland kind of has this hint of evil overtones already. So obviously going dancing at night is going to mean that whomever you're going dancing with is evil, and you're going to suffer in some way. The Christian church needed to vilify the fairies and recharacterize them as demons or servants of hell, in order to maintain control, they made all the folk tropes binary. You were either a servant of heaven or a servant of hell. No human wants to end up in hell, by all accounts a nasty place, what with the <laughs> internal damnation and all. <laughs> yeah, and the blatant disobedience of the male figure who pretty much owns them. They're lessening what he has rights to. If they're out doing their own thing, they are sinning. Right, especially once the Christianity came in. When Christianity showed up, it changed fairy tales a lot. I've seen versions where instead of dancing with princes and fairies, the princesses are actually being seduced by demons. Ooh, I'm going to go find that one. <laughs> the idea persists among more fundamental sects to this day. There were children in my church growing up who weren't allowed to borrow my books to read because they taught evil, books such as The Secret Garden or The Wizard of Oz. I even know people in my generation or younger who weren't allowed to read works by Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, because of witchcraft. You know, one of the things I find interesting, though, is this idea that all of these happenings late at night are inherently evil. You know, the type of person who is luring a young woman out to the glittery, sparkly music and dancing and carrying on in the dark of night. That is dangerous to them. And evil for them to be indulging in this sort of behavior and destructive. You know, it almost has in some ways overtones of of the red shoes. This idea of dancing until you've destroyed a pair of shoes in just one night. Well, that's kind of this story. The destroying the shoes every night is how the king knew his daughters were going out. Well, you know, they just needed to not leave so many clues behind. <laughs> there are other fairy tales where that kind of dancing, that kind of uncontrolled dancing is actually a curse. And the red shoes, once you put them on, you had to dance until they were destroyed. You were compelled to dance. You had to dance. You couldn't stop. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't stop. So it kind of almost gives an evil overtone to me. The shoes being destroyed every night kind of implies that the girls did not have a choice about the dancing either and that they were being danced to death in the night. 
every night you're going and destroying a pair of shoes. It's pretty hardcore. Sorry, I just had flashbacks. All you have to do is have a really good drum beat and a wicked bass line. And come on, who isn't compelled to dance? <laughs> well, they did tend to make it clear in the stories that they were laughing and carrying on even when people died. You know, I've felt that way at about 2 a.m. after a night of dancing myself once or twice. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, in the stories, they were laughing and giggling and whispering and colluding. They they weren't they weren't just sort of they weren't passive. They they were they were actively engaged in their their wanton destruction of the shoes. <laughs> oh yeah, they're willful. It's definitely a negative ad- attribute. A good girl would never be willful. Even Shakespeare, who could be quite the advocate for women's autonomy for the time, wrote a whole play about the breaking of a willful woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a good girl, I believe it or not, but I wouldn't exactly say I wasn't willful. All right, so we're going to move on to the modern lessons. So what do you think that modern audiences could possibly learn from this story? Well, obviously that nice girls don't go dancing. Well, that's eh. not very modern. Oh, nice girls stay home and wait for a husband. <laughs> One of those discarded princes. No, 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 no. No. It's telling modern girls that if you don't want your parents to know you've been out partying all night, kick off your shoes when you're on the dance floor. Yeah, you gotta ship your shoes to your girlfriend's house. <laughs> right? Have them delivered elsewhere so they can just show up at the party and you can wear those out instead of the ones you gotta take home again. Dad'll never know. The UPS man does not care where he drops your shoe delivery off. I myself have received mail order shipments on behalf of a child who had a less than supportive home life. In one version, it's the princesses themselves who turned the suitors who were trying to find out what was going on into stone. Yeah, they were the ones that drug people too. The princesses were not nice in a lot of these. It doesn't make it completely clear, but it seems it was an effect of the sleeping potion they gave them. After several nights, they just ended up stone dead. They never seemed to be the least bit upset about it either. <laughs> no, they were spoiled little rich girls. They they drugged the suitors because they didn't want them to find out what they were up to. And if they can't find out in three days, it's off with your head. And the daughters are like, ha ha, you can't figure it out. So, yeah. They died because they didn't figure out the secret because they were drugged and got their heads removed. That'll kill you every time. Okay, fairy tales like these have broad exaggerations. Like, you have 12 daughters, each more lovely than the last. It it means that either the first one is an unbearable hag, or the 12th one is just like this goddess, mathematically speaking. You know, I think that they each more beautiful than the last is more of an indication that their finer qualities are due to their station in life, their birth as royals, rather than any qualities they actually had within themselves. (laughs) But I would say that these princesses didn't have all those finer qualities and probably just wanted to go live in this fantasy world where they had rich fey princes that took them across the water in the boats. They probably didn't even want to marry all these regular world princes at all. Well, I mean, they had gold and silver trees and princes who loved them. Who wouldn't want to live there? But they were obviously <laughs> enchanted, and love has nothing to do with marriage anyway. I have read where the description of the trees is not only an indication of the wealth of the fairyland, but the progression from silver to gold to diamonds also indicates the passage of seasons, the silver glint of the sun on leaves in summer and golden leaves of autumn. And then the diamonds representing the ice of winter. Huh? So it's like they're magically gone for a full season instead of only a night. And maybe that's how the shoes are so worn. Even cloth shoes, when I wear them for costumes, don't wear out in one night without a lot of effort. Yeah. One of the things I find really interesting in this particular story, and it happens a lot in fairy tales, but is how often it isn't actually the wisdom of the man who is the hero of the story that makes it possible for him to be successful, but the counsel of like a wise elder who never gets acknowledged in the end, or even a name. Like in this one, the old woman that he meets in the forest, who A, tells him what's going on, And then B, gives him the tools to be able to prove what's going on. And you never find out 
why she did that. You never hear about her again. He never acknowledges her existence. But without her, he wouldn't have been successful at all. You know, the hero usually gets advice he must heed from an old woman. If she hadn't given him the cloak, invisibility was key here. Not his intellect or his skills or anything about his person. <laughs> yeah, the hero of this story is a hag. Yeah, the hero of the story is actually the hag. It's always the hag. So be a hag in the forest. That's it. You have your lesson. My goal in life is to be a forest hag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like one lesson is nice girls don't go dancing all night. Lesson two is always listen to your elders because things will turn out right. But, but which elders, though? Yeah, it depends on which elders you're listening to. The father in the story wasn't all that wise. You have to pick your elders. Ooh, Best nice. advice, do not trust the apple woman from Snow White. Oh, stepmothers can't trust them. Well, that was an evil disguise. She wasn't being her true self. I strongly suspect that the old hag in the forest wasn't her true self either. <laughs> she was probably actually from the fairy kingdom and all of her princes were being taken by those fancy ladies from the other world. So she was like, I'll fix their little red wagon. <laughs> yes, she's the stepmother to the 12 princes. And then there's the stepmom who wanted to get rid of the princesses fantasy conspiracy. Yes. That brings in my whole conspiracy theory about all fairy tales being interconnected. Our hag hero is another stepmother from another story with these princes. Everybody loves an evil stepmother. And you know, in some stories, she is the one locking the innocent victims in. It was actually the evil stepmother that locked them in their room. And it, that was, no wait, that was sons, not daughters. Wrong story. <laughs> well, it was daughters in the Barbie version of the Twelve Princesses. Mm. It was it was their their evil cousin. They didn't have a stepmother, but with with stepmothers, it's usually about maintaining control of the heirs. Yeah, but the hack in the forest made me think of just how often you've got this mysterious elder in the woods who gives all the wisdom and magic gifts and fairy tales, and then you just never hear from them again. If I was a hag in the woods, I wouldn't want people bothering me all the time. Once again, my life goal. <laughs> Actually, there was a different version from Paderborn where there isn't a character who gives the soldier all the cool stuff. In that one, he is following three princesses and there have been 12 suitors that have been killed already, making him the 13th to make the attempt. So a lucky 13? Yeah, no, oh, lucky 13. <laughs> and when he follows them through the secret passage, the three maidens are carried across the lake on the backs of three giants. And the soldier isn't able to follow them. But then he notices a lion and a fox with a magic cloak and a pair of boots that they are fighting over. And he suggests that they put the cloak and the boots down and go 30 paces away and then begin to run back. And the first who reaches them gets to have both of them. The lion and the fox think this sounds like a great idea. They walk away. And the minute they start walking away, the soldier grabs the cloak and the boots, puts them on and vanishes. I can't put on boots that fast. <laughs> and, uh, and he wishes to be with the evil princesses and voila, he is wait, magically. Wait. You, you said evil prince. <laughs> Freudian oh, slip. <laughs> I did. Oh, oh yeah. I'm, I am keeping that in. <laughs> <laughs> he wishes to be with the princesses and voila, he magically appears by their side, but invisible. He gets his evidence and then wishes himself back in bed before they return. Stalker. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings in magical creatures, which we could leave for another episode and another tale. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank all of our supporters on Patreon. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. 
You can send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow and give us a good review anywhere you listen and share with your friends and family. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.